Go. Go? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Black, and I'm one of the Rogue Women Writers. We're a group of eight thriller writers whose backgrounds range from former intelligence officer to journalism to psychotherapy to White House strategist. To let you know how this is going to go for you participants in the Zoom room, you will be in the gallery during the reading. We encourage you to introduce yourself by typing your name and any contact information in the chat bar. For those of you joining us on Facebook Live, please comment if you have anything you'd like to tell the authors, and especially if you have a question you'd like to ask. The comments will be monitored and relayed to the authors in real time. The authors will be reading only briefly, so we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. All of the books discussed here should be available through your local bookstore. Let's all use the hashtags, hashtag Rogue Reads and hashtag Rogue, rogue Women Writers to post about our experiences. And as I said, my name is Lisa Black, and I'm the author of 14 novels featuring forensic specialists, which also happens to be my day job. I am based here in Florida, working with my local police department. I'm thrilled to be emceeing this event. So without further ado, let me introduce you to these amazingly talented authors. Jenny Melchman, after getting published, packed up her husband and two children in an SUV, rented out the house, stocked up on homeschooling supplies, and took off on 15 months of book tour. In The Second Mother, Julie Weathers isn't sure if she's running away or starting over, but when she moves to a remote island in Maine to teach, she comes to suspect that she may have traded one place shrouded in trouble for another. The inhabitants of Mercy Island may be more of a threat than its isolation. Jenny says it may sound very Jessica Fletcherish, Fletcherish but her favorite is tea with a healthy homemade muffin. <laughs> And if you go to our website, she shared the recipe. So take it away, Jenny. <laughs> well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Rogue Women Writers. You guys are the coolest. And um, I have to say, it's like a it's like a writerly bucket list moment for me to be with Ryan and Wendy and Kyle on this. I mean, you've got like some of my favorite authors, and you know, we all know that being an author can be very, 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 <laughs> my editor would probably cut a couple of those varies, but not too many of them. Grueling and hard, but then you have these transcendent moments, you know, like the day when you write a scene that you can just like feel through your whole body, or you get to do something like this. And so thank you for giving me a transcendent moment. Um, so the second mother, I'll hold it up. I, 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 I made my camera go away from me. I, that probably doesn't make any sense, but I, I did something where I can't see myself anymore, but hopefully you can see the camera. Um, <laughs> it's my fifth novel. It came out at the end of August. The world was crazy. I think this novel was really born for me a very long time ago. Um, when I was in college, my parents gave me the talk, and that talk was not what you're thinking, probably. It was, well, what are you going to do with this very expensive degree? And that was fine, because I had a plan. My plan was to be a poet and live in the woods in a cabin <laughs> by Kyle of my own making. And my parents pointed out the United States is not very good to its poets. And also I had never really wielded a hammer. So I came up with an alternate plan. Um, and that was to study uh, psychology and become a psychotherapist. But it was definitely plan B. Like, you know, I had always wanted to be a writer. That was the dream. The only reason I turned away from it was, well, it's true, the United States is not very nice to its poets. Um, but it, it, I was not excited. I was not excited to go to graduate school. So the summer between graduating college and when I was to start, I went with my family to a house they rented in Maine. And there was a tiny little island that we visited, not Mercy Island, but a real life, it's real life component. And they were advertising for a teacher in a one room schoolhouse. And I wanted to do that so <laughs> badly. I mean, it was like gonna be you know, like a shiny apple on my desk teacher kind of thing. And I would live on this <laughs> island and eat lobster rolls. I mean, I did not picture what being 12 miles out to sea would be like, it, it was just all gonna be, anyway, I never did it. But, and I went to graduate school and it's lucky I went to graduate school for a reason I'll tell you in a moment. But that kernel lived in my mind all these years later, more of them than I'd like to count. And it became the second mother very much at a time when I was thinking about a character who has nothing to lose because she's lost everything and what would happen if she just went for a fresh start in life. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm going to read you a tiny bit from the second mother. And then I'm going to tell you if we still have time, you'll signal me, Lisa, why it's lucky okay. that I went to graduate school <laughs> instead of becoming a teacher in a one room schoolhouse. But this is Julie, and this is the day that she heads out to the island to start her new life. A rusty sign nailed to a splintery post announced no open alcohol, music only with headphones, life preservers on children under 14, all pets must be leashed. Julie paused to dig around in her duffel, duffel for Depot's rarely used leash, reassuring the dog as she affixed it to his collar. Passengers began to stream off the boat, and Julie studied them avidly, wondering if she were looking at a parent of one of her students-to-be, a friend she might make, or a neighbor. Most of these people appeared to be tourists, though, walking bikes loaded down by day packs, some with picnic baskets dangling from their hands. Depot was overcome by the mix of strangers and scents jumping at the end of his leash. She had to pull back on the leather strap, using all of her weight while giving her dog a look of apology. People steered clear of him, guiding their bikes in a wide circle, although a few sent admiring glances, and one mother crowed to her son, even on four legs, he's taller than you are. Another man called out, gorgeous, Newfie? Probably some, Julie answered. She was a bit overwhelmed herself, wanting to get out onto the boat and to the peace the calm sea promised. He's a rescue. The boat was finally clear, and the people waiting to board formed a loose line, chattering with each other, raising their voices to be heard above the gulls, moving forward without even having to look. The steps so oft repeated they'd become unconscious. Here were the parents of Julie's future students, her friends-to-be, or neighbors, headed to the island in the late afternoon. Although one or two held suitcases, the rest loaded supplies onto the boat that were more easily procured on the mainland. A pallet of rice, oversized packages of paper goods, and supersized bottles of cleanser, even a flat screen TV and a new refrigerator, all ratcheted down with cargo straps. If the purchases hadn't given it away, something else would have done it. These passengers gave off a whiff of the intangible, an invisible aura of fit. The place they were headed belonged to them and they to it. The makeshift gangplank, a single board, wasn't wide enough for two, so Julie had to nudge Depot forward, coaxing him to ignore the bustle of people waiting behind and making sure his broad steps didn't send him off the wobbly piece of wood and into the gray swish of water. She crossed the length swiftly herself, a touch of vertigo quickening her breath, then paused beside Depot to identify a spot to sit. The salt air was dehydrating and Julie found Depot's portable bowl in her duffel. She shook it into shape and removed the cap from a bottle of water, taking a gulp before emptying the rest into the bowl. Depot slashed up the contents, then maneuvered into place, his hindquarters beneath the bench. The ferry gave another loud honk and Julie realized they were moving, the water so calm she'd hardly felt any motion. She twisted around on her seat to watch the dock recede into the distance, farther and farther away, smaller and smaller, until their last connection to land was gone, as invisible as if it had never existed at all. It was the loneliest feeling Julie had experienced in a long time, knee buckling, nearly bowling her over, except that of course she'd gone through far worse. She suddenly missed her daughter anew, felt every vacancy Headley had left, and to which Julie had just added immeasurably by abandoning the last places the baby had inhabited. Singing, <laughs> singing spray settled on Julie's face, convincing her that she had made the worst mistake since the day her daughter had been lost. And there was not one thing she could do about it now. The boat headed out to sea. So that's Julie. Oh. She has nothing left to lose. She's lost everything. It's just her and her dog on Mercy Island. Do so I have another minute or two? The beginning. But, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so tell us why it was lucky you went to graduate school. Okay, so this is why. So wanted to be a poet, log cabin in the woods, all that. When I went to graduate school, I specialized in treating children, and I was given mm -hmm. this very scary case. Um, Lisa might even bring up echoes of your own work. So I was assigned the case of a absolutely adorable cherubic five-year-old daughter, five-year-old girl. Her mother had just brought her in to see me because the little girl had killed the family pet. Something that will never happen in a Jenny Melchman novel, don't worry about Depot. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Good. I was tasked with finding out why this tiny little cherub 
had done this horrible thing. And it was almost as if life was a suspense novel. I sat down, I began writing my first book. It was a long, long time ago. That book was not published. I actually wrote, it was my eighth novel. That was my first one, my debut. But it gave me, you know, I feel like it's like the wrong turn that led me to the right place. Like it gave me, and it hit me like a ton of bricks that, you know, if you want to write, you write the kind of book you love to curl up with at night. And for mm. me, that was books by yeah. Lisa and Chris and Ryan and Wendy and Kyle. And, you know, <laughs> I, I love crime fiction. And even though there were going to be 11 rejection filled years to come, I discovered what I, I believe I was meant to do. So, you know, take those wrong turns. Sometimes they lead us to the right place. <laughs> That's, That's fabulous. <laughs> Okay, any questions quick for Jenny? I have one. Okay. Um, yeah, Jenny, um, you know, you have a couple of situations in the book. Um, you know, the loss of the daughter is one, and then also dealing with alcohol uh, abuse, and then just, you know, being the fish out of water on that island. So there's a lot of um, emotional situations there. One of the things that struck me about your writing, and, and in particular in this book, was your deft way of coming up with fresh um, ways to describe emotion. And did that always come easy for you? Or was that maybe your poet background? Because, uh, you know, some of us still struggle with trying to come up with alternatives to she grimaced or, yes. you know, things like but that. You are not kidding. Yeah. yeah. So could yeah. you talk a little bit about how that works for you? Is that just natural? Did you have to develop it or what? Yeah, I think I probably just, you know, to a fault and maybe I guess you're saying to a credit, I see the world very emotionally. So I struggle with, you know, the parts of the book that are physical and I'm just becoming aware actually of how unphysical a person I am. Like I always knew this because when I read the Reacher novels, my husband would get very scared because I too would act like I could kill a man with my bare hands. <laughs> and he'd have to be like, well, you're not six foot five. And you know, so I think I'm a very unphysical person and I action scenes are hard for me, but emotions, yeah, I guess I just, that's the lens I view the world with. So I'm glad, thank you. Um, I'd be happy to talk about this. It's a great subject. We should do like a, a craft panel on writing with emotion. I've seen a great, couple of good that's books. That's one of the things people struggle with. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. I completely, I'm the total opposite. I'm I'm great with like writing like a, you know, a chase scene or something. But when it comes to like emotion and the character's feelings, it's like, I don't want to talk about feelings. I wanna, you know, I want to find the clues. Okay, well, let's move on to Wendy. Wendy Walker. <sighs> makes us all feel like underachievers, even Jenny, I think, graduated from both Brown and Georgetown <laughs> and has practiced corporate family and child advocacy laws and has three sons. With only four books out, her novels have been translated into 23 foreign languages, topped bestsellers lists both nationally and abroad, been selected for national book clubs and been optioned for both television and film. Her latest, Don't Look For Me, begins with that most inexplicable of events, a mother who chooses to walk away from her own family. People do it all the time, but is that what really happened to Molly Clark? Her daughter travels to her last seen location, determined to find out, but risks a date with the same destiny. Wendy's go-to snack is sharp cheddar cheese with crackers. And my go-to crackers are Ritz, whole wheat, and whoever invented like putting them in fresh stacks, like individually wrapped is like genius. And a Cosmo, which even though I'm like a huge vodka fan, I have actually never had one before. So this is my first. <laughs> so <Yeah>. Wendy, <laughs> take it away. Tell us okay. about your book. I could reach, reach through and, and grab that Cosmo. Um, so, <laughs> um, wow. Um, so Jenny, you and I have so much in common because I also, it took me many years of writing to finally break, break out and in, into the industry. Um, and, uh, and also uh, uh, much of my work is inspired by the work I did with children as a family law attorney. I didn't get the same amount of training that you got obviously as, um, 
going to school specifically for that. But when I became uh, a family family lawyer, uh, I took a, an advocacy course and uh, and, we, and many continuing legal ed, um, education classes, learning about psychology. And that's really what enabled me to, uh, to write thrillers. And before that I had been writing sort of general fiction, which I don't, I don't use the phrase women's fiction anymore because I, I don't think it's necessary to add <laughs> that <laughs> um, extra word, um, just fiction. Um, uh, but they were mostly about women and, and their lives out in suburbia, which is where I had, had landed. Um, so, but unlike you, I was not always um, wanting to be a writer. I never really considered it an option, I think, because my family was very much uh, sort of the American dream family where, you know, my parents were the first generation born in the United States. Um, my generation, with, with the exception of one aunt, we were the first to attend college. And, and so there was always this just feeling of, following, you know, set paths to success and not doing anything that would um, maybe, you know, lead you, you know, astray into, you know, a life of, you know, poverty and, you know, unfulfilled dreams. Um, so it was never spoken, but it was just in our blood, you know, to, to sort of recognize that we were standing on the shoulders of many, many generations of people who had sacrificed for us. So it wasn't until I, I was um, taking time off from corporate law to be with my first son that I gave myself permission to do something that wasn't a clear direct path to some form of you know, tangible success. And when I asked, sort of asked myself what I wanted to do in those you know, two hours a day when my child was napping, <laughs> um, I, I decided I would try to write a book and, and like you, it took me, you know, years to get published and then not published well, and then going back to the law and, and, uh, but I kept at it and kept at it and then got the psychology behind me, um, by practicing family law. And that was like the final tool in my toolbox that I needed to be able to write thrillers. So my first thriller was published in 2016. Um, it was a watershed moment for me. It was going to be my last book because I couldn't keep writing, practicing law and being a single mom by then to three kids. So um, after much frustration and a day where I like cried like the entire day, um, just out of just frustration that the universe wasn't giving me a sign as to whether I should keep doing this crazy thing or not. I really just like, I really wanted a sign, like just anything. And yeah. so you're not I, alone, <laughs> right? I mean, that's how, right. I think that's how a lot of writers feel. I mean, 11 years, right. I was, yeah. I was 17 years at that point from when I first started, you know, writing a page here and there when my, when my, uh, you know, son was napping and, and, and six little bits of success, you know, breaking through with getting a pub, you know, getting two books published and then learning that that wasn't, all it took. I mean, it was really um, a long road. And so um, I created my own universe by asking my wonderful agent um, what I should be writing. And I decided, you know, I, I had tried my hand at legal thrillers, at fic general fiction, and I was just sort of writing whatever I felt like writing at the time. Um, and so I decided, well, I just, I want to just write. I love to tell stories. I love to find, you know, to structure them. I love to write about the emotional stuff going on with, with people and especially um, post-trauma, um, you know, the, the sort of fallout of trauma. And so she said to try my hand at writing a thriller. That, that would be, you know, they, they were exploding um, after Gone Girl. So uh, I had to go and sort of do some research on what a psychological thriller actually was. And then um, All Is Not Forgotten was going to be my last uh, my last book, Do or Die. The, this was, the, I created this as a universe to myself. Like, this is your universe. You're going to do everything right. Take everything, every tool in your toolbox, everything you've learned about writing, everything you've learned about uh, psychology, all of the dissecting of all these books in the psychological thriller genre, 
and bring it all to the table. And if that still doesn't work for me, that was going to be my answer. So luckily the universe answered me with the right answer. Thank you, universe. <laughs> um, and the book, um, you know, got um, sold and, and was sort of, you know, enabled me to, um, to, do, to work full time as a writer. Otherwise I would be still practicing law. Anyway, so don't look for me. I'm gonna read from um, also, so similar to your book, uh, it, it's amazing um, how prevalent this theme is um, over the last, I don't know, several years, even before COVID, I'm sure even more now, um, that I too wanted to create a, um, a woman who had lost almost everything and walks, makes this very emotional decision to walk away from her life. And it was actually sparked by a real life uh, moment that I had not quite as severe as what happens to Molly Clark, but I was having a really bad day at a really bad time in my life. And I was on a back road and I was having, you know, um, all of these existential thoughts about how I had failed my children and I was a terrible mother and what was the point <laughs> of my life. And I, you know, just really going down rabbit holes and, and no way to distract myself because I was stuck on this road. And, um, and then I was getting gas and I saw a road going off in between the cornfields that looked like it was going on forever. And I just had this flash of a thought. It was, it was as the same thing that happens when your cell phone's not working and you wanna just chuck it at the wall and you don't. It's like the, emotion, the emotional part of your brain comes in and is like, this phone is making you unhappy, throw it at the wall. And then your rational brain immediately jumps in and says, no, like $700, all your you know, the cloud, the cloud may not be working, you know, and it stops you from doing it. But that initial reaction is, um, there's actually in psychology, I guess it, it's a like an emotional hijacking of your thinking. And then the rational brain usually just steps right in but it's I triggered from fight or flight impulses that we, you know, we all have them and they're meant for survival. Mm -hmm. Something's causing you pain, get rid of it, you know? Um, so that was, I, I was very fascinated by this thought I had to like walk down this random road, which quickly disappeared. But I wondered, you know, if there was more to it. So that was the, the, the sort of um, beginning of the story. And then I had to do the unthinkable, which was to give this poor woman enough horrific things in her life that would make that emotional hijacking like really powerful and actually be more powerful than her rational brain. And so I sat down at my kitchen table and I thought, all right, what can I do to this poor woman? And I kept like knocking on wood every time I thought of something. So I gave her a child who had died. I gave her then, you know, a husband that she thought was, you know, cheating on her now because she hadn't been able to get over it. I gave her a grown daughter who had whose life had fallen apart. And I gave her a son who had just been really cruel to her and ignored her when she went to visit him. And, and I gave her five years post, you know, the death to have really gone into a sinkhole of grief. And then I, I wrote the first chapter and I was like, I don't know if that's enough. I don't know if people are going to get it. <laughs> so I went back to the table and I, I was like, Oh, I didn't want to do it. But then I, I made her responsible for the death of the child in a in a, an accident a truly an accident but the kind of thing where she was still behind the wheel of that car it's like that horrible situation that you know could not have been prevented there was nothing she was doing wrong it was just this you know confluence of circumstances that caused her daughter to be in the road right when she was turning the corner and so it, it's a horrible horrible setup for Paul poor Molly Clark. And I'll just read very, very quickly. because I know I've been yakking for like way too long. Um, <laughs> so that's where I, so I decided to put Molly in, um, in this chapter uh, where I was because I was so emotionally connected to that scene at the gas station. Um, I gave her this horrible backstory um, and, um, and then I gave, added a storm and I added, what else did I add? A, a big storm. And I think, I think that's everything. Um, so I'm just going to read the end of chapter one, just a couple of pages. So she's been driving and she's been having all these thoughts about her son and how cruel he was when she went to visit him at his boarding school, about her daughter and her life disintegrating and yelling at her that morning, telling her that she hates her. And her husband, uh, the night before when um, she came up to bed, he was sleeping, but he 
had clearly just put a fresh log on the fireplace in the bedroom. So she knew he was faking. So she was, this realization is coming to her that he didn't even want to say goodnight to me. Like he didn't even want to sort of acknowledge my presence in our bedroom. Um, so now she runs out of, she's right at the gas station. She runs out of gas right before it. The rain is coming down. She gets out of the car. She's going to just run to the gas station, fill up, a, you know, one of the tanks, run back, you know, put the gas in and then be on her way. Um, and she gets to the gas station and the gas station is closed for the storm. And so she's standing there and she sees this road. Um, okay. So I will start here. Um, okay, I have no umbrella, just a flimsy jacket. I put it on anyway. I reach for my purse and tuck it inside. It's only 30 feet. I open the door, get out, close it behind me, and I run, clutching the purse. I run into the wind, which is more powerful than I imagined. I run and think about that log, which had just been put there last night on the fire. John wasn't asleep. John was pretending to be asleep, so he wouldn't have to see me, even just long enough to say goodnight. It's not the first time. Flashes of the fight with Nicole break free as my body pushes through the wind. We fight every day now. Open your eyes. The fight had been so fast and furious. I had not processed each word, but I do now. They are open. I see you clear as day, Nicole. Not to me, to your own husband. I can't see what's right in front of me. He never comes home for dinner. He pretends to be asleep when I come into our bedroom. My husband doesn't love me anymore. My husband loves someone else. This thought feels old like a jagged stone I've been carrying in my coat pocket, trying to rub it smooth. No matter how much I dig my fingers in, the edges never soften. And then the words had not, I had not heard before, but had felt many times, still hearing them from my own daughter twisted the knife. I hate you. Tears fall as I run. Annie, wispy blonde hair resting on delicate shoulders, big round eyes and long lashes. I can still feel her in my arms her life just beginning, Annie, Annie. And now I know why the thoughts have all come. They have been leading me to this one last thought, this naked admission. I am not a good mother because I did not drive four hours to watch my son play football so he would feel loved. I drove four hours so that I could feel loved. The log in that fireplace, my daughter's words, I hate you. Evan was all that was left. I had to see his face, see him thriving so I could validate my life, gasps of breath, the wind is strong and the air cold, my lungs are on fire. Maybe Evan knew, maybe he could sense it seeping from my skin, the need I wanted him to fill, which must have felt like poison. A mother shouldn't need things from her child. I caused Nicole's demise, she's certain of it and now feels it feels real though disorienting. I went to my son under false pretenses, caused him pain, caused him to lash out with cruelty. My husband pretends to sleep so he won't have to look at me. Yes, I think, as the grief spins violently in my head, I am a bad mother. This is an objective fact. There's no way around it. I let a child die. I am at the entrance now to the gas and go. I look up and see there are no cars. Orange cones stand in front of the pumps. The rain comes suddenly. The blanket covering the sky is now a broken dam. It's dark, but I can see the writing on a cardboard sign, closed for the storm. So now she keeps walking um, and and she sees the road and now she's on the road and these are her thoughts. You can leave all of this behind. You can start again. You can put down the rock, the burden you carry. I walk along this road until I am part of the storm, numb to the wet, numb to the cold, numb to the truth about the promises. And for the first time since I killed my child, I am at peace. Please let me go, let me walk away. I feel the words in my head like a prayer. Please, they whisper, don't look for me. I don't know how long I walk or how far when I see light coming from behind. I turn to find headlights moving slowly toward me. They're high and bright. It's a truck of some kind, tall but also long. And in spite of the trance I am in and the peace it has brought, I feel both of my arms rise above my head and wave wildly, the purse still clutched in one hand. The truck pulls in front of me and comes to a stop. I walk closer until I'm inches beside the passenger window. There are two fi figures inside. I make a shield with my hand just above my eyes to keep the rain from my face. I lean in closer and see the window come down a few inches. The storm's coming, you know, you shouldn't be out here. It's a man's voice, friendly, but also urgent. Do you want to ride to town? Another voice calls from the truck. The window comes down a few more inches. The voice of a little girl, the face of an angel. Well, do you or don't you, she asks. I stare at her, at her blonde hair and bright eyes and beyond her to the man. 
I stare at her, this young girl, and God help me for a split second, I see my dead child. And then I see this road for what it truly is, a mirage, an illusion. And the words that cause my legs to carry me away from my life, liars. Their promise is nothing more than cheap deceptions. The guilt will never leave me, but I will never leave my family. Yes, I say, the passenger window of the truck closes and the girl disappears, but now I hear the click of the locks opening. I reach for the handle of the door to the second road, desperate to be out of the storm, to get back to my family, to forget what I've almost done. The storm might have killed me, the wind and the cold, then the guilt would be theirs to carry. John, Nicole, Evan, how could I be that selfish after everything I've already done to them? I will never think of it again. I climb inside, close the door, relief fighting with despair. And before I can clear the rain from my eyes and see what's really before me, I hear the click again, the doors locking, locking shut. So, sorry, I read I'm too long. So. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so that's Molly. And then it alternates with chapters of her daughter, Nicole, two weeks later um, after mm. the trail has gone dead, looking for her mother and she gets a new clue and comes back to town. Um, and looks for her at all costs. So you have like a split time frame. You're with Molly every step of the way and you're with Nicole two weeks later um, and the timelines eventually converge. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Well, I have a question for you, but well, we'll, we'll get to it at the end. Yeah. Um, let's go on now to Brian. Brian Freeman hails from Minnesota. And in addition to writing his own stunning books, has also written Jason Bourne novels of Robert Ludlum's line. In his latest Jonathan Stride novel, Funeral for a Friend, Jonathan visits his dying friend, Steve, only to hear a shocking deathbed confession that he protected Stride by covering up a murder. Hours later, the police dig up Steve's yard and find a body with a bullet hole in its skull. When Brian is writing, he'll have a surly, furious IPA in hand, which I don't have because I'm not into beer, sorry. And a good supply of Minnesota cheese curds. I had to look up to look it up to find out exactly what cheese curds are because I've, <laughs> I've heard of them for so long, but I didn't know. And I, I think I would like them, especially the deep fried variety, but we're you know, anything, anything deep fried is good. Fried. Exactly, yeah. So, they also call it squeaky cheese, by the way. Uh, you, it, Wikipedia said that, yeah. <laughs> And even if you're not supplied, I, I have a Surly Furious IPA right here. Oh. And I somehow think Surly Furious should be designated uh, the official beer of 2020. Uh, <laughs> true, but, uh, true. That, that would be a good one. Well, I have this Cosmo thing that at Wendy, I'm just figuring out, is like 90% alcohol. So <laughs> if I start slurring, that's probably why. <laughs> so, Brian, take it away. All right. Well, uh, you know, in, independent of all of the the craziness of 2020, I, I have to say, for me, this has been uh, truly the most amazing year in the book business. I mean, start with the fact this is my 15th uh, anniversary in the publishing biz, and uh, and like Jenny and Wendy, uh, that is a day I, I certainly never thought I would see coming. I mean, I had five books that are still sitting in my nightstand drawer. Uh, now, admittedly, that goes back to when I was 13 and not a whole lot of publishers <laughs> clamoring for uh, books written in Bic pen on binder paper. Uh, but uh, but it, was, it was five books and 20 years before I started in on the one that, that broke through and, and my very first book, Immoral, came out in 2005. So, you know, here we are 15 years later. I've got 22 books out in the marketplace right now. And this year, I've actually released um, three novels, which I can't really believe myself. Thief River Falls uh, came out in January of this year. And uh, I, I love this book. It's it actually I got a thriller writer as a hero. And uh, so you can <laughs> assume that this person is going to be psychologically disturbed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, as Lisa mentioned, I've uh, I, I've had the incredible honor of taking over Robert Ludlum's Jason Bourne series, and so I released my first Bourne novel, The Bourne Evolution, this summer, and uh, it was it was just so much fun to write. I mean, it it was a huge honor and 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 pretty intimidating stepping into the shoes of uh, of a series like Bourne and, and an author like Robert Ludlum. But uh, the first two words I put on my whiteboard were, you know, have fun. And, uh, and I really did. It was just such a fun novel to write. Uh, and now here we are with uh, Funeral for a Friend, which is the 10th 
novel in the Jonathan Stride series, and uh, that just came out a couple of weeks ago. If you think I'm done for the year, though, no, think again. Uh, the, the paperback of my uh, Audible original, The Deep, Deep Snow, will finally arrive in a couple of weeks. So, uh, so that's four launches uh, this year. Uh, honestly, it, it makes me really thank heavens for virtual events, because if I'd had to go on the road and do all this, it, it would have just been crazy. Um, well, Funeral for a Friend, I, People will always ask me when you're talking about a long running series, you know, do you have to go all the way back to the beginning to, to start? And um, I always say, you know, look, I, I write my series books so that um, you can dive in anywhere. And, and I think Funeral for a Friend actually works really well as a standalone novel. You can get to know mm -hmm. Stride and the characters around him. And I always say to people, you know, you, you wouldn't expect to just have friends that you met in their teens and 20s. You're gonna meet people throughout their lives. And, and if you meet them and enjoy them, then I think you wanna go back and, and find out about the stories that brought them to that point in their life. And, and hopefully a good series should work the same way. You ought to be able to dive in anywhere. And if you fall in love with the character, then you wanna go back and, and see the stories that led them to that point. So I'm gonna read just a little bit from Funeral for a Friend from the prologue. And this is actually, it doesn't give anything away to say it's in the midst of a dream that Stride is having that kind of sets the tone for the whole book. Uh, but it's a very intense emotional thriller. Uh, I, I love writing thrillers that have that emotional core to them. I've heard from so many readers in the last couple of weeks that were sort of in tears by the end of chapter one as, as Stride and, and his best friend, Steve Garski are, are at Steve's deathbed. Uh, and and that's, those are the kind of scenes I love to write. And of course, also, I love to then throw in the, the twists that turn Stride's life upside down. So this is just a little taste of Funeral for a Friend. Stride went through the door and found himself in a completely different place. Looking back, he saw that his house was gone. Instead, he now stood on a cliff of black granite, 60 feet over a raging river. The fullness of the summer forest surrounded him. He knew this place well. It was called the Deeps, where Amity Creek stampeded along Seven Bridges Road like a wild Mustang, swirling in whirlpools and sucking tree limbs into its current before spitting them out in the cold water of Lake Superior. From this cliff, you could take a running leap into the water and swim in the black pool below. He'd done it himself dozens of times as a teenager. He and his best friend, Steve Garski, would shout, jump, fly through the air, crash into the water, and fight the undertow back to the surface over and over. But sometimes, when the rains were heavy, the deeps caught a body and didn't give it back. Sometimes the flooded river held a body down and fed it to the lake. Stride stared into the rapids, which boomed like deep rolls of thunder and erupted in silver waterfalls. He was right on the cliff's edge where the spray made the stone slippery. Don't fall, a voice said. Stride turned around. Don't fall, they'll never find you. A man <laughs> stood behind him. He was short, no more than five foot six with a skinny build. He had thinning black hair and wide staring eyes that looked like the mask of a raccoon. His skin was pale. His hair and clothes were soaking wet. He'd been diving into the swollen creek. Drip, drip, drip. Stride heard the noise in his head again, somehow louder than the violence of the river below him. But it wasn't water he heard. The man on the cliff had a bullet hole in the middle of his high forehead a perfectly circular black ringed wound that seeped a ribbon of blood down the man's nose, around his pale lips and onto his chin where it dripped onto the stone like chamber music. Blood, that was what he'd heard all along, blood. Stride's right hand felt heavy. He lifted it and saw that a gun was in his hand, a wisp of smoke trailing from the barrel a burnt smell in the air. He'd shot this man in the head. The wound was right there in his forehead, but the man still had his eyes open, still had a strange smile on his lips. You're dead, Stride told the man. You have to be dead. I shot you. But the man raised his arm and extended a bony, brittle finger at Stride's chest. Stride 
looked down. His own shirt was soaked in blood, fresh cherry red blood growing and spreading into a misshapen stain, a mass of blood, the kind of loss no one should survive. And there was a bullet hole in his own chest, ripped through the fabric, right where his heart was. No, the man told him, laughing. You're the one who's dead. So oh, there we go. <laughs> That's how Funeral for a Friend starts out. <laughs> I like that. Hi. <laughs> Well, I absolutely loved your first book, Immoral. I still have it on my shelf. I remember sending you an email that's, that, and saying I loved it so much that I gave it to my sister, only she had a teenage daughter. So the, the very evil, seductive teenage Rachel, yeah, yes. didn't, didn't sit well at, with her at all. But, you know, she was yeah, totally I, I was so. a little disturbed at how many, how many teenage girls wrote to me talking about what an empowering character that was. <laughs> well... Yeah, I guess you could say that. That's one way to look at it, yeah. <laughs> he was powerful, yeah. <laughs> um, well, okay. I have a question for you about the born about the born books. Sure, yeah. I love the reading, by the way. Um, Thank you. It makes me really want to read the book. It's on my stack. I have this stack, you know. <laughs> it's um, not that high, usually, yeah. <laughs> but but I fell in love with the idea of becoming a writer because of reading the original Born book. And um, I absolutely love that series. Yeah. How intimidating is that to actually try and take that on? I mean, we're gonna hear from Kyle too, who's done yeah. the same thing mm -hmm. in a different series. And I just, it's happening a lot these days and I can't imagine what that's like to get that call and then to have to step up. Yeah and make it work. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sure Kyle will talk a lot about this as well. It, it was, it, yeah, I mean, it was an incredible honor. I mean, I, I, I've been a Ludlum fan my whole life. Uh, you know, The Born Identity, one of my all time favorite thrillers. I, I can't remember how many times I've read it. I mean, going back to when I was literally 17 years old, it came out in, in 1980. Um, and sure, it, it's intimidating trying to think about stepping into the shoes of, of not only a, you know, a giant in the genre by, like Ludlum, but also you know, a, a hero who's so iconic uh, like Jason Bourne. And honestly, I, there were two things. I mean, one, as I say, I mean, I, I just kind of wrote have fun on the whiteboard. You got to just put that aside and, and tell the story. Uh, and, and it helped that um, you know, the, the editor at Putnam was telling me, look, you know, you, you, you're not going to imitate Ludlum's style, because if you do that, it's just going to come across as a caricature. And, and so it really has to be your style filling it through and, and simply being true to who that character is and, and what has made that character so enduring. So, so that, was, that was part of the, the process. And the other thing was, was realizing that um, Jason Bourne had been in my life uh, even longer than any of my own characters. I mean, again, I've known Jason Bourne for 40 years since the, the Bourne Identity came out. So once I kind of realized that, it, it really didn't, uh, it didn't seem that difficult to kind of jump inside Bourne's world. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> that would be quite a challenge though. <laughs> okay. I have, what? Oh, I have a question if we have time. Yes. Or, yeah. Um, you said that you have published these four things this year. Um, when did you start them? I mean, I assume that, you know, how long did it take you to do each one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I wrote three books last year uh, and I'm writing three this year, which I wow. find just, it, and I think I'm gonna do the same thing next year or I'll be institutionalized. It, it's kind of an open <laughs> question. Um, I, I wrote Thief River Falls on its own at the beginning of last year. And then I wrote the Born Evolution and Funeral for a Friend simultaneously uh, last summer and fall. I would literally do one week on one book and one week on the other book, and I would trade back and forth between them, which wow. I had never attempted anything like that. Wow. Well, I, was pretty, I was pretty nervous about how it would go, but I think what helped is they are such very different projects. I mean, you've got the Bourne novels are so action focused and so adrenaline, adrenaline driven and stride, you know, much more inside the head, much more psychological and emotional. So putting down one, I was picking up something that was a completely different story and a completely different character. And so that was, that was energizing. I think that means that uh, it was, it was 
easier for me to kind of trade off back and forth. Honestly, if they were similar kinds of books, I think it would have been much harder and it would have been harder to avoid having the books sort of bleed over on each other. Hmm. Well, thank you for making us all feel like underachievers. <laughs> Even though Jenny and Wendy had pretty much already accomplished that. Okay, let's talk to Kyle. Kyle Mills lives in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which I am so jealous of because like one of my bucket list things is to go to the, um, the Federal Reserve meeting there every year and has also written some of the Jason Bourne novels for Robert Ludlum, as well as Mitch Rapp books for Vince Flynn, as well as his own fabulous book. So again, thank you for making us all feel like underachievers. His new release, Total Power, is about Mitch Rapp, who is usually racing to save the world from some terrible fate. But in this case, the fate has already befallen us when ISIS takes out the entire US power grid. Rapp and his team embark on a desperate search for the only people who know how to repair the damage, the ones responsible. But how can they can succeed when all the normal tools have gone dead? The communications, computers, fuel, even food are simply not there. When Kyle writes, he likes to have a glass of Chard uh, Cabernet or a Spanish red and popcorn, everybody's favorite snack. So I'm gonna munch on this popcorn while you tell us more about Total Power. Uh, all right, yeah. So yes, I am Kyle Mills. Uh, I have written something like 20 books, but over many, many years, uh, I think I started in, in this, I think I wrote my the first novel when I was 29 or something. Um, I feel it's kind of funny listening to everybody's story. I, I, sometimes I feel like a little bit of the outsider. I, um, I got into writing by accident. I, um, I work for a, a bank and I was a fanatical rock climber. And I thought one day that I'd really like to do something creative. So I decided I was gonna build furniture. And my Ooh. wife really kind of pushed back against me because we live in <laughs> Wyoming and she didn't want to, you know, me to fill the garage with all kinds of tools. And so she'd have to park outside and shovel the car out and she said I wasn't very handy which was true so it, she was the one that said why don't you write a novel you like to read that I my degree was in economics I'd never really I'd never done any creative writing at all really so I thought yeah, I really kind of dismissed it and then it just stuck with me and I thought yeah it'd be a fun project so I bought a bunch of you know kind of how to write a novel for dummies books and I read them all and embarked on my first book, which I finished. And I thought, oh yeah, my mother will read it. And, and that'll be, that'll <laughs> be the end. Um, but you know, a bunch of people that read it, you know, the kind of friends and family that thought it was really good. And I, and some of them were people who were normally really critical of me. So I thought, oh, maybe it's worth trying to get published. So I started that back then it wasn't even electronic. You had to send out all these, you know, letters to people saying, yep. you know, I've, I've, Nail -nail. <laughs> yeah, and it was, you know, and it was just the lamest, you know, the, you know, I've never written anything before, but I think this book is good. Um, but I did eventually after a hundred, probably a hundred uh, declines, I, I did get an agent and much to my surprise, that book went on to be a national bestseller. Um, and my agent signed me to a two book deal, which, was great on its surface, but I had never really planned on writing a second book. So I embarked on that, which was horrible. It was the worst job I ever had. I mean, the first one is a lot of fun because you're just doing it, you know, for enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And this one, my first book had done quite well commercially. So there are a lot of people pushing and pulling me in different directions. And I felt like really an imposter because there are all these experts, you know, editors and agents and all these people who had these ideas and I felt like I needed to incorporate them all. And um, I, I just, I really hated it. I, you know, my stomach hurt, my hands shook all the time. And my wife was, you know, thought I was going to have a heart attack when I was 30. <laughs> and so I ended up just uh, sending my business faxes back then. And I sent my agent a fax and said, you know, I haven't spent any of the money. If I were just to give it all back, can I quit? <laughs> And 
he called me at like seven the next morning and woke me up and he said, nobody from New York will call you again if you just deliver a book, it doesn't matter what it's about. So I said, okay, I think I can work under those parameters. I churned out the book. That, went, that became a New York Times bestseller. So the, that, that is how I embarked on and now like something like 20 books, which is kind of, kind of a strange way to get into it. I, I think I'm the, I'm the outlier. Um, and yeah, I we did, hate you now. With the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, we hate you now. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's, probably. it's kind of a, I don't know. Sorry about that, true. <laughs> it's kind of funny though. I, mean, I think other people get like, had all this. I think the satisfaction maybe was a little less though. I mean, when most people get their first book published, and particularly their second book published, it's this incredible joy. When I wrote my second book, I wanted to kill myself and you know, go like. No, know, you're not alone in that. Yeah, any any job would have been better, I think, than that job. Um, so uh, I think. Um, so anyway, yeah, so I wrote a bunch of my own books, um, and I got a call, uh, from the Robert Ludlum estate, much like Brian did, and at one point and asked me if I wanted to write a book, book, few books for them. I initially said no, because it just seemed like a strange thing to do. I'd always been a big Ludlum fan though. And then I kind of thought about it and thought, you know what, this would be really interesting, right? In somebody else's style, you know, I'd go back, probably learn some some things, uh, you know, in case, you know, in the thought, idea that maybe I'd stagnated a little bit after, I don't know, at that point, I don't know how many books I'd written, maybe 12 or 13. And, um, and yeah, so I did a few of those. It was really fun. It was a science oriented um, uh, series that, and I'd always been a science geek, but it never really worked for my style. So I had these ideas I'd never been able to use. And I got to, I got to use them on on that one, I said, uh, you know, I told my wife I was going to write a, a Robert Ludlum zombie book, which I <laughs> had always wanted to write, and but nobody was going to notice, and they didn't. Um, so I wrote a few of those, and and then I was I had kind of finished up with that. I did three, and uh, I was going back to my own stuff when uh, when Vince Flynn passed away, and I had been a fan of his since the beginning. I remember reading his first book because we started out around the same time and just kind of wanted to check out the competition and ended up, you know, being a real fan of his and of the series. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, the last man, the last book he had written had sort of just ended, you know, Vince used to arc stories over uh, various books and it was a terrible ending to a character, you know, like one of the most beloved characters in thrillerdom. Um, you know, he didn't die, he didn't retire, he just sort of <laughs> didn't even finish the story, he didn't really catch the bad guy. So um, I remember thinking sort of selfishly, I hope they hire somebody to at least write one more um, mm -hmm. and, you know, finish him off, kill him or do whatever, you know, maybe he decides he wants to whatever, you know, go into lawn care, I don't know. Um, and so, I don't know, like a month later or something, somebody called me and asked me if I wanted to do it, uh, which was a big surprise. I, particularly, since I didn't really write in his style, particularly. Um, and again, I thought, I don't know, you know, this was a much larger scale job than I had ever done. Um, you know, Vince was a number one New York Times bestseller pretty much every time out. And uh, I wasn't sure how it would be received. It, somebody doing it and I honestly didn't know if I wanted to uh, you know jump into waters quite that deep um, but I but I I really thought it would be a super interesting challenge and be really fun and I really loved that character in the in that universe so um, I did it and I did it a little differently I think than Brian because my goal particularly because the new book, The Survivor, which followed The Last Man, he'd written three pages of it. And mm -hmm. Ike went into it deciding I wanted to write a forgery. So I was going to write the book that Vince wrote down to his word choice and everything. And no one was ever going to find those three pages. I was going to stick them somewhere in the book, but no one <laughs> would ever know which ones were mine and which ones were his. Mm -hmm. Or even how much, I didn't even tell people at the beginning how many pages it was. So a lot of people thought like I'd written, he'd written the first 28 chapters and I'd written the rest. I'm not sure where 28 came from, but I got that a lot. Um, 
And so that's what I embarked on is really to, uh, to emulate, you know, the idea that it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, uh, to really emulate his style and not use mine. Um, mm -hmm. And it seemed to work. I, you know, people really, the survivor, it seemed like people were really, there was a real outpouring of, of positivity, which I was not sure was going to happen. I thought I was kind of expecting the opposite, but people were like me. They wanted to see the Mitch Rapp character continue. They wanted, mm -hmm. um, they wanted Vince's legacy to continue. He was a really beloved guy. I mean, like an amazingly, one of those people that everybody's ever met becomes a good friend of his. So um, that book was turned out to be really successful in the sense that fans really seem to enjoy it and they seem to really want Mitch to go forward. So now I've written a lot of those books. Um, <laughs> the uh, you know, Total Power is the new one and that just came out. And that one um, would be number six for me because I'm working on number seven. So uh, yeah, and, and, and I always try to throw something new at Mitch, you know? Um, and with this one, it was, what, the idea was you know, that the power would the grid would be taken down, which is something I'd been interested in a long time, but also fundamentally the idea was what would happen if Mitch didn't save the day? Cause he always had before. Um, and he mm -hmm. had to kind of pick up the pieces in an environment that nobody really worked in since I don't know, probably like the early 1900s, right? I mean, <laughs> there's no internet, no phones, no, mm -hmm. no nothing. So in a country descending kind of into chaos. Uh, and that actually, you know, I think is, is hit home a lot more with uh, readers than even I would have imagined. I spent a lot of time sort of explaining what would happen and what it would be like. Um, but then coronavirus came along and now I think people, it really got, gets them now on a gut level because they know, they have some small inkling what it's like to go to the, the grocery store and there not to be any toilet paper, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. if it was much worse, <laughs> You know, there wouldn't mm -hmm. be any food either. So, um, so a lot of fun, you know, to write these books uh, and really different. I mean, you know, it's very much more action oriented than anything I've written before. So it's, I don't know, it's a little like being a kid again. You gotta, you know, <laughs> go in there and go pew, you know, sh type it away, <laughs> shouting and yeah. Um, so uh, it's, been a, it's been great. It, it's, it's been really fun and getting to know the fans and everything. And so I am actually visiting my in-laws and I'm living in a little cabin by the woods. So I didn't, uh, I don't even have a book with me. So I can't okay. I'd like to hold it up, but, and I'd like to read from it, but I can't. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Well, you're, let me get this straight. Your father was an FBI agent and the head of Interpol? Well, not at the same time, but yeah, yes, well, yes. My, yeah. Yeah, so he was that. He was the legal attaché of the United Kingdom. And uh, so, yeah, I got to grow up around a lot of really interesting people, you know, MI5 people and MI6 and CIA and, and all that. It's kind of one of the reasons I chose thrillers. Is so you must have internet. like a massive amount of inside information that you can use in your, in your books. Yeah, particularly characters, I think, because I've known these people since I was a little kid and I was really fascinated, you know, young boy and there you're surrounded by operators all the time, which was, <laughs> you know, pretty ideal, really. Um, right. And, you know, just interesting people. Oddly, my father is really good friends with a lot of thriller writers, which is hmm. kind of funny. And I did. So that's I met, you know, Tom Clancy when he's first starting out. My dad is the FBI character, Dan Murray. Uh, my fan, my father's name is actually Daryl Mills. He kept the same uh, initials, so he's a character in those. And I'm not sure why that is, but it, it's pretty. It's funny that he knows more thriller novelists than I do. I think. Um, wow. So yeah, fun way to grow up, and you know, something that's informed my writing over the years. I'll say. I believe Karna had a question for you. Yes, go ahead, Karna. Yeah. Um, hi, Kyle. Karna Bodman hi. here. Old Good friend. to see you, Karna. How you doing? Uh, you <laughs> mentioned um, uh, your parents. Uh, I remember how delightful they were. We had dinner together when they were in Naples one time, and you said, hey, look them up and, and whatever. So we did and talked about all of this. And then I just, um, looking ahead, we've been fans of yours for years. Um, uh, tell us, if you want to give a hint about what Mitch, you know, might get involved in in book number seven or don't you want to give anything away? 
No, sure. You know, I, with I kind of had you kind of go two ways if you're if you're writing these kinds of thrillers. Now you uh, can either sort of shy away from the political turmoil in the United States, which is super tempting. And that was my plan uh, was to just kind of maybe pull somebody out of Mitch's past and forget everything that's going on in the United States, or you can meet it head on. And in the end, I thought that would be more interesting. So uh, Mitch is gonna tackle kind of a lot of the, the threats that are going on internally in the United States, uh, as opposed to so much externally. And how the United States' position in the world is changing and what threats are gonna come with that. So we'll Very see interesting. How Very yeah, interesting. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're running out of time, but I did have a few quick questions if, if there aren't any from Facebook or something. We, we mostly have comments on Facebook. Um, we actually had quite a few people join and um, Good. Several have said, oh my gosh, looks like I have some new books that I'm going to have to start <laughs> reading. So that's the good news. Um, cool. Okay. I have um, a question, uh, if ahead. you have time for one, and this could be yes. for any of the, the authors. Do you ever want to branch out into a different genre? Um, or do you feel like, you know, you're too locked into your you know, your agent, your publisher's expectations. Um, I mean, would you, would you try to do that if, if that appealed to you? You understand the question? Sure. Yeah, and for me, I, I know, I mean, in a lot of ways, I kind of feel like I, I'm, I'm doing some stuff in, in alternate in genres. I mean, honestly, I think of the Bourne book as being sort of very different from more of a psychological thriller uh, that I do with, with most of my others. Uh, and, uh, and I actually, uh, a lot of folks don't know this. Uh, I actually wrote a book and published it under a pseudonym uh, a, a decade ago uh, called The Agency by Allie O'Brien. And uh, it was a uh, female first person narrative. And uh, it was uh, uh, focused around a, uh, a woman who was a literary agent in, in London. And it was uh, <laughs> a, and not a thriller in any way, shape or fashion. It was just, you know, pure, fun, snarky, sassy, uh, uh, you know, just a, it was a, it was a hoot to write. I hope it's a hoot to read. So yeah, I, I had a great, you know, great time with that. And I'd, I'd love to, you know, explore some other genres as well. I mean, the, the standalone thriller I've got coming out in March called Infinite just kind of grazes along the side of, uh, of, of sci-fi. So uh, yeah, I, I love, you know, sort of exploring different areas. And you wrote a chick lit novel called West 57th, didn't you? Yeah, which was, it was a follow-up to the agency. And I, I wasn't going to use the word chick lit myself, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what it's, <laughs> no question about. Okay. Hey, Brian, um, quick question on, on your point right there. Um, you said that you wrote these other books, which I have to check those out, um, with a, you know, a pen name yeah. and, and all that. How, how did you, how did they sell? How did you market those? Because you were known by your other name, you know, did you have to get a different website? Did you, the publisher do a whole different, how do you do that? Yeah, it was, it was completely different. And it was a project I worked on with my agent um, uh, who was, uh, who name, her name was Allie. And, and so we kind of had fun with our names in doing the project. Um, uh, yeah, it was a completely different thing. Um, I, I ended up with the same US publisher on that it was do, as was doing my stride novels, um, but the process was totally different. And we had a great run with it. I mean, it was reviewed in People Magazine. They, they give it a great review. It was a, it was a lot of fun, um, but yeah, it was, it was, we, we deliberately wanted to have a completely different name because it was so different from anything that I'd been doing in, in my thrillers. I thought it, from a branding standpoint, it was sort of going to be weird if, if I was associated with it because it was such a different kind of product. Hmm. Thanks. So anybody else want to write in different genres? Well, I feel like I'm a little like, I'm a little like Brian in the sense that I kind of have, you know, I've written Robert Ludlum books, and then now the Mitch Rapp books, which are much more sort of action oriented. I once wrote a first person book about the tobacco industry that didn't really have any gun play in it or anything, just because hmm. it was a subject matter that I was really interested in. And uh, yeah. and I, I maybe that's why I've gotten into the book forgery business, uh, <laughs> is that I've always kind of come up with an idea and then to some extent, changed my style to match the idea um so it works with the idea like the 
you know, the tobacco industry one just worked better in the first person. I'd never written a book in the first person, but it just seemed to work better that way. So I changed to do that and which has been helpful in writing in other authors' styles. So I think, um, I think it'd be fun. I'd be like, I've, I always wonder how far you could go with that. You know, I mean, <laughs> could I write Victorian romance? I think that'd be really fun to try. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of diversity within the thriller genre. Um, and all four of my novels have been completely different. And, uh, and I just did an original short actually, which is a little bit of a sequel to my first thriller. And when I, sat down to write this character again it's in first person and he's a very you know peculiar character uh it was it was like coming home and i realized uh you know i wrote that five years ago and i was it was amazing to me how i it felt like i hadn't seen him for so long and i was so happy to be <laughs> back and i realized then that really what i've been writing each book ha ha is has a different voice different narration structures um, different pacing. So I feel like I do, I'm already sort of writing, um, you know, pushing the boundaries um, within my, within my genre, or at least with, within my with own capabilities. So I'm, I'm good where I'm at, but I'm only four books in maybe after <laughs> I, I'm an iconic, prolific author, like these two don't be, um, uh, itching to do something else, but right now I'm pretty good. Yeah, I love, I love this genre. And I think one of the things I love about it is that it's so wide ranging. And I, I do feel like I blend <clears throat> different genres in it, but it's because I don't even like the term genre actually. And it's often used, you know, as like a comparison, like against literary, which I don't believe exists. Um, but I, I feel like this thing that we are all doing has so many multi varied threads and that's part of the beauty of it. I would not want to be anywhere else. <laughs> Wendy, I just finished Emma in the Night. And so you dwell a lot on narcissistic personality disorder in that. I was wondering, is there some personal connection or was it something you ran across or why did you decide to focus on that? Um, it, it really uh, came from necessity of having uh, the mother uh, have a particular personality that would have the impact that it did on her children and on the family. And that came from my training um, as a family lawyer. So I sort of went through my, you know, mental notes of the different disorders uh, that would cause that kind of dysfunction in a family um, and narrowed in on narcissism. And then I did a deep dive researching, uh, speaking to experts in the field and reading and, you know, really getting, uh, uh, my, my hands around what family life is like when there is a mother who has narcissistic personality disorder. And I read a lot of online, um, you know, blogs and chats and things from people um, who grew up with narcissistic mothers. So that's where that came from. And it was, uh, it was fascinating uh, to construct that character and, and the, the children that, uh, that resulted from that family. Do you have, do you have kids, Wendy? I do. I have three, three boys. Yeah. Was, <laughs> I just, I find it really sometimes very difficult to read stories where kids are killed and stuff. I, and I, I mean, I do, I read them, but I don't know if I could write one very well. We have six kids and <laughs> It's one of like the biggest fears is that something is going to happen to your kids. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, in in Don't Look For Me, um, it was really just, you know, it, it happened in the past and it was really about uh, giving this, you know, this woman um, just a really tragic backstory. Uh, and it was very hard to do. It was very, very hard to do. As I said, I was like knocking on wood the whole time I was coming up with her backstory. Um, but Emma in the night, um, uh, it's, you know, she's, it's a grown, there are the two daughters are, you know, pretty much grown. So I don't really, I don't think I constructed most of my novels on, uh, on, on <laughs> things happening to children or dying, but, uh, but yes, it is difficult. And I, I just, you know, when you're writing thrillers in this space, it's, 
they're usually things that are very close to home, which are your loved ones and your your children, your spouse, your mother, your sister. The idea of killing animals and killing kids. I mean, I can go <laughs> the level up the you know evil people or the you know go get the bad guys all you want. I, it doesn't bother me a bit, but. Um, it's it's when it gets that personal i think it's i'm i'm impressed i would have a hard time um digging that deep so i mean jenny's is that way too kind of, you know her books are a little yeah. that way too, so it's, it's my good publisher says that my book should come with a sticker no children or pets harmed in the making of a jenny melchman novel yeah. <laughs> there yes. is like an off-screen backstory similar to what Wendy's talking about with an infant in the second mother but basically I'm more like you Chris like a a I like the justice play and I like to save the kids and the pets. Depot's <laughs> a hero at the end of the second mother. <laughs> no it's I mean it's fascinating how how people go about constructing what they work on and what you know what pulls them to write about I I, I think it's fascinating. Hmm. Thank you. So Jenny, I wanted to ask what's more stressful, writing or psychotherapy? And can you do oh a clinic gosh. for writers suffering from insecurity? And if so, yeah. can I sign up? <laughs> that would be a great psychological thriller. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, writing is my, like I love writing a first draft, I should say. For me, that is sheer bliss. And I know a lot of writers don't feel this way. I do get my comeuppance when it comes time to edit, so don't like throw tomatoes at the screen. Yeah. But writing is, you know, I said I wasn't a very physical person, but in my books, I get to be like, you know, I get to be the Jenny version of Jack Reacher. Like I get to be triumphant and it's just an incredibly empowering process for me. There's a bookseller who told me that when she reads one of my books, she feels stronger as a person. And mm. that's how I feel when I'm writing them. So writing, hands down, that that and psychotherapy you know that's a privilege and I, I mm -hmm. feel you know honored that I was there at different people's lives I worked with a lot of uh children of narcissistic personality disordered parents and other personality disorders I stopped psychotherapy when I was thinking of the book when I was in session and then I knew I was not doing right by my clients anymore Kyle mm. I have a question for you real quick um are you still, do you still climb and do all those kinds of things? Do you still get out there? Uh, you know, I'm a big mountain biker and backcountry skier and trail runner. Now, uh, climbing is a young man's sport. I uh, <laughs> started to, my body started to fall apart at like 33. And I, I had mm -hmm. to give it up if I was going to uh, still be able to move my fingers and arms in my, my old cousin. age. My cousin is a really big climber, David Jones, and he he started doing um, spelunking, and they he's like oh, the yeah. lead climber in some of the caving for Lechuguilla and stuff. They did a National Ooh. Geographic. Oh wow! Um, and he was the lead climb on that. Um, but he said the same thing. It was it got to him. So I just wondered how long mm. you could keep that up. Yeah, some people last a little longer than I did, but uh, I was also pretty cautious about the fact that, you know, I only have one set of, you know, limbs and I, I needed them <laughs> for a while longer. <laughs> and the head. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're out of time about, so we should probably call it a day, but this has been so fun. This has really been fascinating talking to all of you. Very thank you everyone yeah thanks for having yeah. me yeah thanks for having you all you guys thank you for we joining have a lot of people join us online and this will stay up um next month we've got dp lyle karen dion and boyd morrison boyd morrison coming um <laughs> so stay tuned it's pretty fun Thank yep. you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good seeing all you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.